Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. On Saturday at the LDS General Conference, uh, Boyd K. Packer announced to the LDS Church that the second coming of Jesus was a long way off. And the striking thing about this is that that is something that is uh, very different from what was taught in the early days of the LDS Church. The LDS Church was founded very much as an end times uh, group. They were preaching that the end of the world was at hand. They were gathering the saints to Zion for the end of the world. And it's amazing that you didn't see in those early days so much of a focus on trying to, to establish churches and to, uh, build temples and all these things out everywhere, but rather to bring people back for what they thought was going to be the end of days. We're going to look at that a little bit tonight. Before we get too far into it, though, uh, I've been asked to let you know that the uh, new schedule for TV20 is available at www.tv20.tv, and um, you can find that on the Internet. You can also give a call here to 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Well, in the early days of Mormonism, there's a, there's a wonderful book uh, called Thief in the Night by Signature Books that goes through uh, so much of the evidence for this. In the early days of Mormonism, you see this constant drumbeat of impending judgment. The last days had been brought in. It is with, it's not without reason that they are called uh, the Latter-day Saints. They believe that this was the final in-gathering uh, before the coming of Christ. You can, go, you can see it in the things that Joseph Smith said, the uh, LDS apostles, their newspapers, all through it. And we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. I want to lay a little bit of groundwork, though. To me, it's striking that the LDS church starts very much like so many groups that we see today saying that the end of the world is at hand, and they're the ones who understand the signs. They're the ones who see the, uh, all the very uh, various uh, manifestations of, of God's warnings, and they have the, the truth. Just this year, we saw the fiasco with Harold Camping, and there were people who were devout, people who sold their homes, sold everything they had because they believed that Jesus was coming back this year. Spring didn't work out so well. Harold Camping has now revised his date to October, I think, 19th. It's hard to keep up. Uh, he had predicted it back in 1994, but that didn't seem to dissuade people from thinking that finally he had it right. Over the last few months, we've done a number of shows that have dealt with the various people who have set dates, who think they found some secret reading of the text, some code hidden in the Bible or something other than the very clear thing where we're told that Jesus is coming back like a thief in the night. What happens all too often is people take things that have already been fulfilled, like the destruction of Jerusalem, and they say, no, 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 that, that wasn't really referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in that generation. No, we're going to rebuild and redestroy the temple so we can rebuild it yet one more time. I hope you've seen that that doesn't really hold up well in the light of Scripture. But what is it that motivates people that makes them so happy at the prospect that the world's coming to an end? What motivated thousands of people to follow Harold Camping? I think, honestly, part of it is just frustration with this world. They see that the world has problems. They see that there's sin in the world, that there are dishonest politicians and dishonest lawyers, and uh, there are corrupt churches and all kinds of other things, and people get tired. But I think that, honestly, part of it is there is a certain resonance 
in all of us, but especially in some people, towards hatred. And that if we can somehow make hatred seem pious, it will motivate people to follow. It's hard to get people to follow you on the basis of a common vision. To tell people, we're positively going to go out and we're going to do A, B, C, and D. There's a reason that you don't see many politicians do that. Because what happens is people get bored, people don't care, or you get someone that they agree with points A, B, C, and D, but they don't agree with E. And so then they, they just write you off entirely. If you want to motivate a crowd, if you want to motivate a mob, give them something to hate. Play to their frustrations. Tell them that the, th the things that they are frustrated about, they have every reason to be frustrated and that it's a mark of their godliness that they're frustrated. Don't tell them to love their enemy. Tell them to cheer on the destruction of their enemy and you'll gain a following whether it's marches up in, Wall, uh, in New York on Wall Street or whether it's uh, in churches. There's a great temptation for people to hate and to cheer on destruction. And unfortunately, that's what we see often in early Mormonism. Uh, the Evening and Morning Star was one of the earliest newspapers put out by the LDS Church. In February of 1833, this is just a sample of the kind of judgment language that we see over and over. It says, we live in a great time, one of the most eventful periods that has ever been. It is the time when the wicked shall be destroyed, when the earth shall be restored to its former beauty and goodness and shall yield its increase, when plague shall be sent to humble the haughty and bring them, if they will, to a knowledge of God. Yea, it is a time when the wicked cannot expect to see the next generation. Yea, it is that great time when none shall live in the next generation unless they are pure in heart. Now remember, this is written in 1833. There is a truth to the idea that this is a fallen world and that we look for something so much better we look for the undoing of the fall that Jesus Christ brings about. But how does Jesus have us do this? He tells us that we're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to bless those who curse us. We're supposed to, to do good. But the temptation for sinful men is to, is to find some kind of way to justify cheering on people's destruction. Now, there are imprecatory prayers in Scripture. There are the Psalms where, we, where there's a calling for judgment. But it's always balanced with a humility. It's balanced with the knowledge of the fact that we're sinners ourselves. And so there's an understanding that, yes, I long to see Christ return. I long to see the, the effects of this fall undone. There is... There is uh, a comfort that the ungodly will be judged. And yet also there's a te it's tempered with the knowledge that apart from the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, I'd be one of them. But that balance isn't found in a lot of end times groups. Instead, there's a cheering on. And there was a great confidence in those early days that they were living in the last generation. Now, you need to understand, contemporary with all that's happening in the early days of Mormonism, there were other groups that were saying that they were, that they were at the end of time. We've talked before about William Miller, who in the 1820s uh, had this spiritual experience, claimed that he came to faith in Christ. He didn't want to be corrupted by any of the traditions of men. And so uh, he just locked himself away with his Bible. That sounds humble, but it's really arrogant. Basically, he assumed that by himself, he would learn more than he could ever learn from anyone else. The conclusion he came to was that everyone who had ever read the Bible had misunderstood it, and he found the truth. And he concluded that Jesus was coming back in 1843. 
This was very popular. Uh, he wasn't the only one. And you read Oliver Cowdery, one of the, the scribe for the Book of Mormon, uh, one of the one of the th three witnesses. He confessed that he fully expected the world to end within 15 years. After the election of one of the presidents, he said that he did not expect to ever see another president elected in the United States. When this was written in this uh, Evening and Morning Star, remember it's written in 1833, this is the last generation. They said there, the wicked cannot expect to see the next generation. And it says, none shall live in the next generation unless they be pure in heart. Has that happened? We see over and over these, these promises of judgment. And we see the time of that judgment being very close. Now early on it seems that there was much more of this immediate expectation, but Joseph Smith then began to move it further out and seemed to, to settle on the date around 1890. Uh, Apostle George A. Smith in the Journal of Discourses back in uh, 1862 confessed frankly that in the 1830s many of the Latter-day Saints uh, believed that the world was going to end in nine or ten years. That was the common belief, according to George A. Smith. That's what he preached at the tabernacle during conference. So he, this, is, this is something that's not debated, it's, it's readily admitted. But how that fits with the whole claim of being the restored church is another matter. Uh, before we get into more of the judgment, I want to look at Joseph Smith's expectations of the return of Christ. In Doctrine and Covenants, uh, section 130, verses 14 and 15, Joseph Smith said, I was once praying very earnestly to know the time of, of the coming of the Son of Man, when I heard a voice repeat the following, Joseph, my son, if thou livest until thou art eighty-five years old, thou shalt see the face of the Son of Man. Therefore, let this suffice, and trouble me no more on this matter. Um, Does God know? I mean, according to Psalms, Joseph's days were numbered before there was yet one of them. But here the expectation is if Joseph lives uh, to the age of 85, roughly 1890, that that is going to be, um, he's going to see Christ. And you see this expectation repeated over and over. The people who heard him uh, people like uh, Oliver Huntington, they, they understood that, that based on what Joseph Smith said, they should be expecting to see Jesus in 1890. But unfortunately, like so many of the other prophecies, when they didn't come true, just like the followers of Harold Camping weren't dissuaded, just like the followers of William Miller weren't dissuaded, but went on to found the Seventh-day Adventist and, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, people, people find a way to rationalize. In the History of the Church, uh, Volume 1, Joseph Smith, January 23, 1833, says, Among the number, my father presented himself, but before I washed his feet, I asked of him a father's blessing which he granted by laying his hands upon my head in the name of Jesus Christ and declaring that I should continue in the priest's office until Christ comes. Over and over you see this expectation that, that Joseph Smith is going to live to see the second coming. That expectation in the early 1830s gets tempered it's not going to be in the next few years, next nine or ten years. It's going to be further out. But it's going to be in this generation. And that's the consistent message. Just like we've seen uh, Pat Robertson teaching that you know, the, the last generation was during the, uh, the 80s, uh, Jack Van Impey with his false prophecies and all these others. It's the same kind of thing. 
They're telling people that yours is the last generation. And it appeals to people. Because it's hard to be a link in a chain. It's hard to uh, have to lay the foundations for generations to come. It's a whole lot easier to think, hey, the rules don't apply to me. I can, instead of doing all this hard work, I can go out and I can, I can do something that makes me feel really pious. I can go out and be a missionary. I don't have to worry about providing for my children because they're never going to grow up. I don't have to worry about my grandchildren because they're not going to be any. I've talked in the past. I, I knew people that were slightly older than me that didn't go to college because they were convinced that after having read Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, the early editions of that back in the early 70s, said the world was going to end in thermonuclear war within 40 years or so of 1948. So they said, okay, well, that's 1988, and you back up seven years from that for the rapture. The rapture is going to be 1981. And people live their lives that way. A good friend of mine, he married a woman who had grown up in the um, Plymouth Brethren. And her parents were upset that they got married. How can you get married when we're about to go through this great tribulation? And then they not only got married, but then they had children. Of course, now the children are in their 20s and 30s. But the parents were convinced the time was there. The appeal is that all the old rules don't apply. The appeal is that you're the wise person because you see the signs and you understand it. And these people who are much more educated than you are, these people who have um, all these positions of power and everything, they, they, they know nothing because they don't recognize the signs that you recognize. And so there are people who are still following Harold Camping, getting ready for October, um, that I think we're just a little over two weeks away from the second date this year that he said Christ is coming back. We're going to press on through this and look at how this this pronouncement by Boyd Packer is so alien to the historic faith of the LDS church. You have this group that's gone from being a millennial end times group that claims to be the restoration of the one true church. Now they're, they've abandoned that, just like they've abandoned polygamy. They've abandoned um, so many of the other things that historically they stood for as the restored church. There's, a, there's an abandonment of this end of the world. Uh, being at hand. Um, Boyd Packer says, no, it's a long way off. So go on about your lives and don't worry about it. The phone number here, if you'd like to join in the conversation, is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. We invite you to call in and join the conversation. Um, a few more quotes here from Joseph Smith to give you an idea what what was he teaching people? What was he telling uh, the Latter-day Saints back during the 1830s to expect? In the History of the Church, Volume 2, uh, this is the setting of this is Kirtland, February 14, 1835. It says there, President Smith then stated that the meeting had been called because God had commanded it. And it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. He then gave a revelation of some of the circumstances attending us while journeying to Zion, our trials, sufferings, and said, God had not designed all this for nothing, but he had it in remembrance yet. And it was the will of God that those who went to Zion with a determination to lay down their lives if necessary should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time or the coming of the Lord, which was nigh, even 56 years, should wind up the scene. 56 years from 1835, you have 1891. One of the funny things is if you go out on the internet, you actually find that the Baha'is, uh, some of them have tried to latch onto this and say, he was right. He was announcing the, the coming of Baha'u'llah, you know, the founder of... Um, 
the Baha'i movement. Um, I don't think that would make many Latter-day Saints happy to think that was a possibility. Uh, we'll save that for another time. But here in the history of the church, Joseph Smith is saying that there's going to be one last pruning of the vineyard before the coming of Christ. And it's going to be a, about 56 years. Um, as I read you earlier, this isn't the first time. Back, it said it back in volume one. It says it here in volume five, uh, two. Uh, volume five, we see the same thing. History of the church, volume five, page 336. Um, Joseph Smith said, were I going to prophesy, um, this is what precedes what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, you can go ahead and put that up. The preface to it, uh, the immediate preceding paragraph says, were I going to prophesy, I would say the end of the world would not come in 1844, 5 or 6. He's referring to the, uh, the Millerites. Or in 40 years. There are those of the rising generation who shall not taste death till Christ comes. I was once praying earnestly upon this subject, and a voice came unto me, uh, came, uh, said unto me, my son, if thou livest until thou art eighty-five years of age, thou shalt see the face of the Son of Man. I was left to draw my own conclusions concerning this, and I took the liberty to conclude that if I did live uh, to that time, he would make his appearance. But I do not say whether he will make his appearance or I shall go uh, where he is. I prophesy in the name of the Lord God, and let it be written, the Son of Man will not come in the clouds of heaven till I am forty-eight. Uh, excuse me, 85 years old, uh, Joseph Smith. Now, that's a quotation out of Joseph Smith's diary. What's funny is in the history of the church, they edit out what immediately follows. Um, he says 48 years hence, or about 1890. He's very clear. Um, here he hedges a little bit. But it's very clear, there is, they're living in the last generation. He hedges it a little bit in that second paragraph, but in the one before, he said, there are those of the rising generation who shall not taste death till Christ comes. So what generation rising in 1835 is um, still with us? It's like William Miller saying that Jesus was coming back in 1843 and then in 1844. Um, it didn't happen. So people tried to rationalize it. You had the second Adventist say, well, it's the beginning of the last generation. So we need to add uh, 30 years to it. So then they said 1874. When that didn't work out, one of the leaders, a man by the name of Charles Taze Russell, he said, well, 30 years really isn't long enough for a generation. It should be 70 years. And he started something known as the International Bible Students and published the Watchtower Tract and Bible Society uh, was the publishing arm of that. Became the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were convinced that... 1914 was the date, and they went around declaring millions now living will never die. 1914 came and went. What happened? They changed it to 1918, and then to 1925, then to 1941, and then to 1973, I think it was, 1978. They've backed off this to a great extent. It's now just at hand. But it's the same kind of mindset. And I think it's significant that you see this shift in the LDS church. You've gone from this imminent judgment where everyone who disagrees with them is being condemned to judgment to now where the judgment's way off and they want to get along with everyone. You know, we're Christians too. When did, when did the LDS Church start officially recognizing other groups as legitimate churches? 
Every missionary I've met goes through the first vision and says, Joseph Smith was to join none of the churches because all their professors were corrupt and all their creeds were an abomination. I think it's somewhat of the schizophrenia that you see where on the one hand there's this universalism that we're all Christians and we just have different le uh, levels of light and on the other hand we are the one true restored church and everyone else is you know, from, from the whore of Babylon. Um, though I honestly haven't heard that language so much since uh, Bruce McConkie died. But if you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. We're talking about the change that we see in the LDS church in terms of the second coming. That first generation, they were convinced they were the last generation. If not exactly the last generation, they were the next to the last. Because the next generation, the only way that anyone was going to live is if they were pure of heart. There was a judgment coming. And it was coming fairly soon. Um, Parley Pratt is one of my favorites among the, the early Latter-day Saints. Um, partially because, unlike so many people today, he, he drew clear lines in the sand. He said exactly what he meant and uh, didn't like what he said, but so many times trying to deal with people today, it's like trying to nail jello to a tree. It's hard to get any kind of clear answer. You get a lot of hemming and hawing and a lot of evasion and qualification, but you don't get very clear statements. Here's what I believe. Parley Pratt was one of the original 12 apostles of the, Latter of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints back when it was called uh, the Church of Christ, and, and even after the name was changed. He wrote a response to a critic of the Mormon Church called uh, Mormonism Unveiled, Truth Vindicated. He's responding to another book called Mormonism Unveiled. And I have a, a bit of a lengthy reading, but I hope that um, you'll bear patiently with it. He's, he's quoting, he's citing references in a Mr. Sutherland's book. He says, see also page 514 and read the fate of our nation and the fate of the Indians of America in the day that the Gentiles uh, should reject the fullness of the gospel, the Book of Mormon. See also page 526 where a sign is given and the time clearly set for the restoration and gathering of Israel from their long dispersion namely the coming forth of the Book of Mormon uh, should be the sign. And in the day this work uh, should come forth, should this great event commence among all the nations. Also, page 526, all who will not hearken to the Book of Mormon shall be cut off from among the people. And that too in the day it comes forth to the Gentiles and is rejected by them. And not only does this page set the uh, time of the overthrow of our government and all other Gentile governments on the American continent. But the way and means of this utter destruction are clearly foretold. Namely, the remnant of Jacob will go through among the Gentiles and tear them in pieces like a lion among the flocks of sheep. Their hand shall be lifted up upon their adversaries and all their enemies shall be cut off. This destruction includes an utter overthrow and desolation of all our cities, forts, and strongholds. An entire annihilation of our race except such as embrace the covenant and are numbered with Israel. Now, Mr. Sutherland, I will state as a prophecy that there will not be an unbelieving Gentile upon this continent 50 years hence. And if they are not greatly scourged and in a great measure overthrown within five or ten years from this date, then the Book of Mormon will have proved itself false. Here's Parley Pratt, an apostle of the LDS Church, stating by prophecy, not an opinion, not 
not simply a, um, a guess or conjecture. He is stating, supposedly under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, stating as prophecy that 50 years from 1838, there would not be one unbelieving Gentile left on this continent. We're going to talk about this some more, but we're going to go ahead and take our first call. We have Dale from Salt Lake City. Uh, Dale, good to have you with us. Oh, I'm uh, glad to be with you and uh, speaking to you tonight. I have not uh, heard you on the television, seen you on the television before, so I don't know much about you, but I'm glad you re read that quote because uh, it's, it's so important uh, in understanding the passivity with which the people of Utah have responded to the Reconquista. Uh, they, I grew up in Mormonism, and there's a seed of self-annihilation, <laughs> or at least acquiescence, to annihilation that's planted in every mind. I don't know about the kids coming up today, but we we all knew we had kind of a death wish going uh, once the Lamanites got up on their hind legs and um, gave us what we, you know, what was going to be our comeuppance. But I had a question for you uh, prior to hearing you uh, talk about that, and I, I presume you're of the, uh, of a Christian uh, faith at yes, this point. I, yes, I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the valley. Well. Well, Pastor, what I what I have the problem with uh, in understanding Christians is that there, there's a huge amount of evidence and information available. Uh, things like the Saga of Gilgamesh, other Sumerian writings, that pretty clearly show that the Old Testament writers were, you know, what we would call plagiarists today. They didn't really attribute back then; that wasn't a custom, but. Uh, they at least did not indicate that they, you know, that they were transmitting information that was already centuries or millennia old when they talked about the creation, Dale, what have you. Dale. They just sort of were quiet about that at least, and at worst they claimed to have been the mouthpiece of God. Now how can you ignore that, and, and why doesn't that sort of impeach some of your, your foundation as a, as a Bible believer? Dale, number one, it's the Epic of Gilgamesh, not the saga. Um, yes, yes, uh, thank wh you. Why, uh, why don't you lay out the parallels that you think are so um, clear there? Well, I, I don't pretend to be a scholar on the subject. Obviously, but, I got the name wrong. But Well, no, no, wait a minute. What, what, all right, well, let's talk about substance. What, uh, well, what well, parallels well, I mean, are there? At you. What, what plagiarism is there? Again, in the, in plagiarism is a modern concept, and, uh, but, but I think there's a something odd about being able to read the whole Bible and uh, these folks attributing what they're writing to being, you know, the, the, the words of God as, as given to them when uh, the, the, the details about the flood and uh, many other details that are in the uh, first five books of the Old Testament are in Sumerian writings. Uh, um, Can you name any of the others? The Garden of Eden, the flood, the great, you know, the great, the great wasting of the earth and all that. That's, uh, it's in, it's uh, quite a bit of detail from what I understand. I don't read Sumerian, but this is Dale, you know, what I've read. Can you, uh, can, uh, you name any other, can you name any of these other ancient Near Eastern works? No. Okay. Uh, I would encourage you to read the Enuma Elish. Uh, you can go back and read a whole host of these ancient Near Eastern writings. Uh, all that you've really mentioned of substance is that there's a mention of a flood. Now, if the flood is historical, I, I don't think it's surprising that we find references to floods in other cultures because they're all survivors through Noah of the flood. The fact that we have a flood, which I hope I'm not confusing. Um, it's been a while since I've read them, um, but the Enuma Elish and uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, and there's a few others, but those are the main two. Um, the reason for the flood is that you have this um, group of gods that are bothered by the noise that are being made by the people below. And so they flood uh, them and uh, destroy them. Other than the fact that you have a flood, nothing else is parallel. Now the fact that there actually is a historical flood, uh, rather than this shaking my confidence in the scriptures, it actually confirms it because, or you know, helps confirm it because uh, you would expect that 
uh, other groups are going to recognize some historical truth. You know, just the fact that um, I disagree with Jehovah's Witnesses on a whole host of things doesn't mean that we disagree whether Charles Tage Russell was a historic figure or not. The fact that um, they would agree that Jesus is a historic figure. Of course, they try to remake him into something very different from what the Bible teaches. But I'm not shaken by the fact that they also agree that there's a historic figure. Dale, uh, the reality is that you do see in the Old Testament a recognition of many of the things that were being taught around them. There's polemics against some of these pagan groups. When you get to the Psalms, you find that one of the Psalms was actually written before David in praise of Baal. Mm, sure. But it wasn't that they were uh, it wasn't that they were plagiarizing. What happens, I forget which uh, psalm it is offhand, but they take a psalm of Baal and completely turn it about and praise God with it. And it's meant as a polemic against Baal, as well as giving glory to God. So to just simply say, which I've heard numerous times, people say, well, there's just so many parallels. It's like, have you ever read them? I have. And, well, the, and there's such a difference. I mean, it's, it's like the people try to say, well, the, the New Testament uh, doesn't include all these books of the Bible that it should include. Right. And it's like, have you ever read them? Some of them that, they're put, that you'll see uh, put forward were never pretended to be apostolic. Things like First Clement. It's simply a letter from the Bishop of Rome, Clement, to the church, church in Corinth. It doesn't teach anything heretical. It's just a, it's just a, a, a letter uh, encouraging them and pointing them, by the way, back to what Paul had written in his, uh, I believe, first epistle to Corinth. But when you start getting into the more Gnostic kind of stuff, like uh, the Gospel of Judas was real popular National Geographic channel a few years ago, if you actually bother to read it, it is the biggest bunch of garbage that you ever read. Pastor, um, if, Pastor, if I interrupt you, uh, I'm a little confused by watching your image that's uh, uh, coming at me at uh, one moment and your voice was just slightly delayed. I haven't done this before. But uh, if I could just uh, throw a couple other things at you and then I'll... I'll well, I'd like the, to stay on topic uh, if we could. If you, got, if, you have, if you have a uh, question about... Um, the second coming. Let's focus on that. But if not, yeah, we yeah, need well, to move well, on. Well, let me let me suggest that I'll bone up on my Gilgamesh uh, information a little bit and and perhaps call you again. Would that would that be okay? You can you can call me off air as well. Right. Please and, understand and, this. But, but Pastor, uh, one last thing, if I may. Then the the Gilgamesh thing. The the problem with it is is not so much that um, the Hebrew prophets are telling perhaps describing some, the same event, but it's that their timing, I mean, the dating of the thing, um, you know, the, the, as I understand that the Gilgamesh or the uh, Hebrew prophets would have said that the, the flood happened sometime post, obviously post Adam and Eve, so we're talking about later than 4000 B.C., according to them. The, the writers of um, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh were writing before that, as I understand it. And I'll, I'll, no. uh, I'll let you comment, and uh, I'll just call you again next week. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, it's funny the, the different directions we end up, but I appreciate the call. No, um, Epic of Gilgamesh is written long before Moses, but Moses is um, writing about something that had happened long, long before. Moses is writing... Uh, roughly, um, you know, thousands of years after the event. Uh, the fact that Epic of Gilgamesh is written f before that, also describing something in ancient history, doesn't mean that Moses stole it from, uh, from the Sumerians. You know, we, we try to use good logic 
when we're dealing with buying a car. Uh, we, we, we try to use good logic in terms of a whole host of things. But I see very little of it, and I'm not, I'm not ragging on Dale here, but I don't see a great deal of it when people deal with the Bible. Most of the critics that I have spoken with about the Bible, they know next to nothing about the Bible. They may actually can remember one or two of, of their supposed contradictions, which are generally dealt with very easily. But, you know, we had a couple of uh, LDS missionaries come up to our door a week and a half ago, uh, maybe two weeks now, and uh, they were speaking and they wanted to know what I thought of the LDS church. And I said, well, I said, I respect my LDS neighbors. I think that they're good neighbors. Um, I think that there are many good things about the culture here, but as a religion, it's the wrong God and the wrong gospel. And um, we got to talking about that and they were telling me how biblical it was. And I said, if you don't mind my asking, I said, let me ask you a few basic questions. I said, who wrote Titus? They go, I don't know. Who wrote 1 Timothy? Timothy? The Paul's epistle to the Galatians, it deals with a major heresy in the early church. It's really focused on one major subject. What was it? They didn't know. Hardly anybody knows anything about the Bible anymore. But everybody has an opinion on the Bible. I have people who come up to our book tables and they want to know what we think of um, the, uh, the Nag Hammadi Library of Gnostic works. Or they want to know what we think of the Dead Sea Scrolls or this and that and the other. And I used to actually try to give them a, a a reasonable um, response. But it didn't take too many times before I figured out they didn't want a response. And so I put these basic questions to them. I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to answer you. I can, I can talk to you about the Gospel of Peter. I can talk to you about Paul and Thecla. I can talk, I actually know a, a, a decent amount. I'm not a scholar, but I know a decent amount about uh, the, the Gnostic writings and I know a decent amount about the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the, the Qumran community and things like this. So I can actually discuss that with you, but do you know, do you know Bible 101? Do you know grammar school content about the Bible? And it became very obvious that none of them ever did. No one who ever came up to our book table asking me about the Nag Hammadi Library had ever even bothered to read it. At least to any, they all said they knew the Bible, they all said they read it, but none of them could answer even the most basic questions about it. I'll put the question to you. Do you know the Ten Commandments? You may think you do. Can you actually sit down and, and you don't have to do them in order, you don't have to do the full form, but can you name all Ten Commandments? And yet people think they know the Bible. And they think that they can make a judgment about it based on the most superficial information imaginable. I would encourage you, please read the Bible for yourself. Realize that, that people have died to be able to have this. You know, I could give you the gruesome stories about uh, you know, the Viet Cong uh, using it as toilet paper and the prisoners carefully trying to retrieve pages and clean them so they'd have a Bible. And yet everybody has been conditioned to think that they're so learned if they, if they simply state some kind of objection. Um, you read the Gospel of Judas 
And there's a few passages that actually seem somewhat like the Bible. But then it goes on and it tells you about all these various spiritual levels of reality. And you had the archangels, I think, create the angels, and the angels create, create or uh, the archons created the archangels. And it's, it's this uh, layer upon layer of spiritual reality, which is straight out of Gnosticism and finds no place in the scriptures. You know, the funny thing is, you actually read the Bible, you read the story of Genesis, and you read Revelation, it all fits together. It's written over the course of one and a half millennia. The Gnostic stuff, you read it, it's very clear, it's fraud. And the early church knew it was a fraud. Irenaeus in 180 uh, AD, in his book uh, Against Heresies, says these people who claim that they have some secret teaching of the apostles, you're too late. You're too late. Um, we were taught by the men who were taught by the apostles. We know what they taught. We have the books that they gave us. When we compare what you give us to them, it, it's, it's, it's like reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe versus... Uh, reading the Gospel of Matthew, it's clear they don't come from the same author. Anyway, we're going to squeeze into the call. We have Dave from uh, Salt Lake City. Dave, good to have you with us. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, uh, I have a question. It might be a little bit off topic for the night, but... Uh, we seem to have wandered a bit tonight. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so what I was wondering, I, I, I've been taking a class in paganism, and uh, one of the teacher had told us that... Uh, a lot of the, or he couldn't think of any um, uh, traditions of Christmas that were not pagan. And I, I heard you mention the Jehovah Witnesses and how they, you know, we all know that they don't celebrate Christmas. Mm -hmm. what, what is your, uh, do you have an answer for that? I mean, is there, is there anything about Christmas that we celebrate now as, as Christians that, is not, that does not have a pagan root? Actually, not a whole lot, honestly. Um, the Reformed churches, um, on the continent, you would have them still um, celebrate to some degree. But the British churches, the, the Presbyterian uh, churches in Scotland, the Puritans in England, uh, they would not celebrate Christmas. In fact, they would um, purposely preach on anything else uh, if Sunday fell on Christmas. Uh, one of the ministers in, in our denomination was a Scotsman by the name of uh, John Murray. And his famous quote was, uh, all good Scotsmen plow their fields on Christmas Day as a witness to their Catholic neighbors. Essentially, um, Christmas wasn't even celebrated a whole lot in America other than amongst the Germans and a little bit by the, the English, but until um, the Victorian era because of um, was it Prince Albert was married to uh, Queen Victoria and um, he was German and the Germans uh, the Lutherans had continued to celebrate Christmas but most of the uh, many of the Reformation Protestants uh, would not celebrate Christmas and if they did only in, in a restrained way because when you go back to the roots of it it is pagan um, the, the celebration of, of the winter solstice um, was Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. You know, the days get shorter and shorter. What happens when, when Christianity tries to uh, deal with a pagan world is that often there's this temptation to compromise and to bring in these traditions and to wrap them in Christian garb. Uh, you see it today. Um, you know, historically, when given a, a choice between watching a football game and worshiping Almighty God, people would have chosen the latter. But we live in a society that loves to watch football. So what many churches have done is they can't either cancel their Sunday evening service um, so that people can stay home and watch football, or they have them come down and they all watch the football game together rather than worship God on the Lord's Day. Um, it, it's, so it's, it's, it doesn't seem 
like a correct thing to do to me. But let me, let me ask you <laughs> this question. What about, um, you know, it is winter solstice, and from what I understand from some of the reading I've done, that Constantine tried to blend his population together, which was made up of pagans and Christians. And that's why a lot of the holidays aligned. So, um, I mean, but that kind of is different from what you said that's not celebrated until Victorian time. So, no, no, no. Well, well, I mean, amongst Protestants, it was not as big except among the Lutherans and High Church Anglicans. The um, Historically, Pres Presbyterians did not celebrate Christmas. Um, the Puritans did not celebrate Christmas. Uh, it was not that big a holiday in America until the, uh, the, the Victorian time. Now, it had continued to be a big thing amongst the Lutherans and, all, and of course, all among the, the Roman Catholics. But see, basically, Roman Catholics had, had uh, created all these feast days and all these holy days, and um, they were meant to educate people and a whole host of other things. But this isn't biblical Christianity. Nowhere do you see Christmas set up as a holy day. It's, it is something that came about as, I mean, the reality is the church has to function in the world. What do you do when uh, people are used to, to listen to heavy metal music? Hopefully, uh, you can teach them to sing things that are glorifying to God. But a lot of churches try to instead accommodate themselves to heavy metal music and says, you, you know, basically you can headbang for Jesus. Right. <laughs> and so it, it's all the same thing. It's just try, people trying to um, minimize the stumbling blocks. And unfortunately, they end up creating stumbling blocks. They add to the Word of God. They create traditions that aren't there. Essentially, Christians have 52 holy days every year, the Lord's Day. And well, let me ask you this, uh, if I still have time. Um, I'm wondering, you know, paganism kind of went underground or was destroyed by Christianity. I mean, not only like in a spiritual way, but more physical, violent way. I'm sorry, what, what was your question? Well, I mean, what, I mean if, let's say in 300 A.D. there were just as many pagans as Christians. Oh, there were, more there, there were more pagans than Christians in 320, you're thinking 312 A.D., uh, conversion well, of Constantine. Why are, why are there more Christians now than pagans? What happened to all the pagans? Who says there are? Were they killed? No. No. What, um, I mean, we've got three minutes left. Uh, what has happened is that um, some of the paganism has been cast to the side. We, we, we're no longer sacrificing our babies to idols. Uh, we're sacking, sacrificing them to our own convenience at, uh, at 52, what is it, 52 million since 1973. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not doing, we don't have uh, cultic prostitutes, but you know, we still have people telling us that there's this spiritual enlightenment that comes through um, promiscuity. Um, we don't have um, the overt things of paganism that we used to, but paganism has never been destroyed. Paganism has been baptized, it's been repackaged, and it's been dressed up in a few ways. But much of what calls itself Christianity is just as, is, is as much pagan as it is Christian. Well, look at Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism doesn't follow the Bible. Roman Catholicism has created this whole system of, uh, you know, you're made right with God because you're baptized as a child. That makes you right with God. You're born again. Uh, you, you do all the various things they tell you that you don't find in the Bible. You have all these sacraments that they've created. And they have the power to remit sins and, um, and let you out. And they, send, they created purgatory, which they supposedly send you to, but then will let you out if you pay enough money or say enough prayers. Well, I guess I'm kind of confused now because it seems to me like there's... Dave, I would, much, I would encourage... Not I, much Christian left, or, or, according to the way you would define it, or 
it's defined differently than I had always thought, because I would think Catholics would be considered Christian, as well as Lutherans and Protestants and, and Baptists and so forth. Dave, long story short, um, we're not in a post-Christian age, we're in a pre-Christian age. Uh, we have come a long way to where a third of the world gives at least lip service to Jesus Christ. That's a long way from the upper room. Um, I have to let you go, but I encourage you to call me anytime. Um, the church number is 801-969-7948. Um, Thomas Leonard, personal physician to Henry VIII, uh, learned to read Greek so he could read the Greek New Testament. And he wrote in his diary, if these are the Gospels, we are no Christians. This is the standard. God has spoken, but everyone wants to do what seems right in their own eyes. We need to actually go back to the Bible. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of the show. Um, hopefully these other things have been helpful. But I think we also need to remember Christ is coming back, and we should look forward to it. But it doesn't mean we have to try to invent ways of twisting the Bible to our own ends. We invite you to worship with us Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., uh, Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. Christ Presbyterian Church is a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We meet, um, uh, we meet at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna, as I said, 11 a.m., 5.30 p.m. We have a sister congregation. Berean Presbyterian meets at 3350 Harrison Boulevard in Ogden at 9 a.m. on Sundays. We hope you can worship with us soon. And you can go to our website at www.christpres.net. Until next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings, and we hope to see you soon. Good night.